afternoon, everybody, again. Um, my name is Brian Terry, um, professor o in the University of Oxford um, at the School of Medicine, but I live in, in Kenya. But I live in Kenya, and I live in Kenya. Uh, I'm very pleased. This afternoon, the idea is that the, this morning was very intense in terms of the hard talk with directors general, current, and present. We're going to try and look a little bit at this interface between research. URI is a research institute, but it has to deliver goods in the, in the field. And so we've got, uh, we've got three people who have very much the responsibility of being at the sharp end uh, in, in delivery of technologies or of services. Uh, I have Peter Jeffries, who's the chief executive officer of GalvMed. Those of you who haven't heard about Galvmed, I will tell you a little bit more uh, about it. Uh, Sarah Jackson, uh, who is the head of Verdant Ethiopia, which is uh, involved in the AFAR in terms of pasture management. And a young man over there on the extreme uh, left, uh, Asagi Tenegne, who is, uh, who is an Illery staff member, but he is very much involved in this livestock and irrigation value chains for Ethiopian smallholders, so at the front line uh, there. So I'm going to uh, start off by uh, talking to Peter, who is uh, close to me. Peter, uh, you are with Galvmed. Galvmed uh, is a charity, I understand. Uh, so how does a charity uh, uh, operate at the, at the front line? I mean, it doesn't sound as, as if that's the right sort of all type of organization to be at the front line. How does it operate? Thank you, Brian. So we are um, a charity uh, in in the UK or in England and Scotland, um, but we're also a not-for-profit company. So, and the focus is really on operating as a not-for-profit company. The goal of Galvmed is to put in place approaches which are replicating what you find in the private sector, specifically in terms of diagnostics and vaccine, and, and in some cases pharmaceutical development, uh, picking up the research in the optimal model, picking up the research that's done in places like in Illery or in other universities, research institutes around the world, taking it through a formalized uh, process of, of product development, getting it to the point of registration, and then in a perfect world, passing it on, de-risked, ready to go as a product that goes to uh, private Earth sector. Does a, and you are presumably involved in developing country issues. Where, whereabouts? Africa and Asia, is it? Or? Africa and South Asia. Well, and so why do you have it? Why do you sit in Scotland of all places? <laughs> I only took up the job 18 months ago. <laughs> no, there is a history to it, and you're right. I mean, th 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 there's a logic to it, but there's an illogicality to it as well. I mean, What's the, the, the logic? The logic is that we're sitting in we a centre. want to know what the logic We're is. sitting in a centre of excellence for animal health next to the Rosen Institute, next to the Mordun Institute, next to uh, University of Edinburgh. Do you talk to them? And we they've got their own agendas, totally. Yeah, but we can partner with them. We sit on the side of the Mordun Research Institute, and, uh, and, uh, and we have offices in Nairobi, in Delhi, uh, project office in, uh, in South Africa in fact, as well. And offices in Delhi. I mean, one thing that one can't help thinking, looking at, uh, at Galvmed, is that you've got you're all directors. I mean, you're probably, you're the CEO, so you seem to be one of the only people that isn't a director. Well, that's a false observation. <laughs> <laughs> but you are the, a director, in other words. But the point, the point is, I mean, the goal is to have people who have specific skills, because everything we do, and, and it's really important for me to emphasize this, everything we do is partnerships. We work with a lot of consultants, a lot of institutes, private sector, to pull things through. So Galvmed actually does nothing itself. We have no labs, we have no, um, you know, no facilities for registration. Everything we do is through influence and through partnering with uh, consultants who bring the requisite skills. So we do have a lot of people who are professional people, but in fact we only have about a third of our staff are, are director level. Okay. And we are a small organization. <laughs> um, uh, Sarah, Sarah Jackson, uh, Verdant uh, Ethiopia. Um, I, like the, I like the name, Verdant Ethiopia. Uh, you work principally in the AFAR region at the moment, or that's where your, your, your activities are, is that correct? Yes, so the currently. The AFAR is not burdened. Uh, uh, but we want it to be. Okay, <laughs> but how are you going to get Af the AFAR region to be burdened? Well, there's massive potential there for improving the grasslands. They've been degrading over quite some time. You've got significant areas of bare ground, areas where the perennial grasses have degraded, and you've got massive 
uh, decreases in soil quality there. Now, if we can rebuild the soil, bring the perennial grasses back, as, been, as has been demonstrated in places in Kenya and Zimbabwe, there is the potential to have perennial grasses growing most of the year because the improved soil can hold so much more moisture for a much longer period of time. I, I, are you sure? I mean, I, I read a, a, a statement, that was a, a quote from you in a, in a, in a British mag uh, newspaper, I think it was. It says uh, that you said 40 years ago there was shoulder-high grass in the Afar region. Well, look, I was working in the Afar 40 years ago, and, I, uh, and I'm short, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, <laughs> But I, uh, it was all just about covering my feet. Uh, so, so where did that statement come from? Um, that actually comes from our partners at the Ethiopian Institute for Agricultural Research, who's been working there with a specific community for that length of time. Well, that's good and news. And when if he first went there. So uh, yeah. have they convinced you under false pretenses to get into this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. No, no, there's massive potential there. Okay, and, you've, and you are linked to the, the, the Alan Savory uh, Institute? Yes, so we're looking to set up a savory hub uh, using holistic management techniques and working with communities to, yeah. Holistic management, I mean, that, what a wonderful collection of, of, of two words. I mean, it's Very nice, isn't what, it? Where, uh, what, what does holistic management mean? Well, it's actually quite a misunderstood term because a lot of people who've actually heard of it with Alan Savory directly link it to grazing and pasture management. But the actual holistic management is massively broader. So it's not as absurd as it might sound at first glance. So it's a decision-making framework which looks to integrate social, economic, and environmental factors into any decision. Currently, it's being used for policy development. It's being used for fisheries management. And I was recently sent a video about how it's been used for urban planning. Okay. So it is quite broad. I'll come back <laughs> to you, and I'll come back to the research uh, the links in a minute. Uh, uh, Asage, you are, uh, if anyone should know about things at the front line, it should be you, because you've been involved with Uri uh, uh, I at the front line. For, uh, so wh wh what are you... You are running this LIVES, which is uh, Livestock and Irrigation Value Chains for, for smallholders. Is that correct? Uh, how is that different from anything else that's been going on uh, in, uh, in Ethiopia in, in supporting smallholder livelihood? Thanks, uh, Brian. Uh, I think uh, it's a very unique project, I would say. Uh, and uh, it started with the previous project, IPMS, under the request of the government of Ethiopia, okay. when they decided to move transform subsistence agriculture into market orientation. And they requested the CG system to help in that. And that's how we are set up. And the first phase of the project, which was IPMS, was completed in 2012. And CIDA was happy, the government was happy, IRI was happy, so managed to get LIVES project as a continuation. But again, in LIVES, we focused on livestock and irrigated agriculture, based on our experience in IPMS. And we partnered with Emui, Simon is here, yeah. to, for them to look after the irrigation part when we focus on the And this is a part. wide range of different species, is it? Yes. So we not deal just cattle. We, we deal with uh, uh, dairy, beef, sheep and goat, poultry and apiculture in the livestock front, uh, fruits, vegetables, and irrigated fodder in under irrigation. Oh, I mean, it sounds fantastic. I mean, the, the, the water side, I mean, li uh, livestock have got a terrible reputation uh, with water. You've got potatoes at the one end consuming almost no water. I think the figure for a, a kilogram of beef is 15,000 litres of water to produce a kilogram, probably not necessarily in Ethiopia. How, w what are you doing different in terms of trying to look at this uh, water consumption? I don't think we're we are dealing with that directly. I think the, the, the cows in Europe probably consume more than the cows in, in Africa. But for us, uh, much of the water issue is related to feed production. So we're looking at improving efficiency of irrigation systems and trying to introduce improved forage into, into the irrigation system apart from the horticulture crops to integrate high value livestock commodities, particularly dairy in the system. Okay, let's try and now look a little bit at the research uh, in interface. What is the research behind what you do uh, Peter, I mean, what, is there any research? I mean, you just picked up the odd. I think the idea of Galvmed was it was going to take 
the so-called low-hanging fruit uh, of, of technologies that were uh, that were almost there, and you were going to move them. But do you have a research component? So broadly, no. The the focus is is not to do the research, but to pick up other people's research and take it through development. Okay. Do you we pick do up have research from this institute. Well, we've, we've worked closely with uh, Ilri on uh, in well, for example, the transfer of the East Coast fever vaccine down to uh, to Malawi and the improvement of processes around that has been a close linkage with Ilri. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the vaccine, that's the infection and treatment vaccine. Correct. I mean, it's only been around for 50 years. And, uh, but how many batches have been made in that uh, time? Um, I don't know. But I mean, I do remember going to the opening of the Malawi uh, unit about mm, 20 years ago. Uh, and now you've reopened it. Please. We've re-equipped it and uh, we re-capacity built. So and what's going to be new? That well, uh, what is going to happen that is different from what happened before? Well, I would like to think that the focus is not only on the scientific side, but on the business side, so having a business case that makes sense around it, because we can easily see a way that the, the facility there will uh, uh, be producing two and a half million doses of, of ECF ITM within two or three years. That would be a sustainable business for them um, and, and, and will be sufficient to keep them keep them going, which has never been an area of focus in the past. Is this going to be exported all throughout the region? It's a regional product, yes. And, and are people going to be happy with the Malawi uh, vaccine coming into Kenya or Sudan or something? Well, certainly, I mean, the, uh, as you well know, it's not uh, without its challenges. I mean, the uh, the vaccine certainly seems to work. We're doing some work, I mean, and again, another area where we're doing some research is looking at the suitability of those strains in the conditions in the markets where, where the product where the disease occurs, but the product isn't yet available. So Rwanda, Burundi, um, South Sudan, and so on, to see whether it's a suitable product. You're again. doing that work. Well, we're, again, everything we do is it? yeah, we're commissioning it. We're partnering. Who? Who, who is? Well, who are you commissioning? Well, we're working with the governments locally. Um, we're working. We're doing the the uh, molecular typing uh, in Unzo in Zambia, and uh, and uh, the. Uh, uh, and then we'll hope to put the, the product into the field under controlled conditions to see uh, suitability, but the, the molecular typing of, of okay, the organism Okay, Sarah, if I can move on. Uh, you, you, the back to the Savory, Alan Savory hub. Alan Savory, I mean, the, this holistic management is, is one thing, and you've just des described it as, a, as an organizational framework. Um, but it's, it's a little bit of a cult, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> you have to, uh, you know, I mean... Uh, I saw that you were fascinated when you saw Alan Savory's TED talk. Uh, I don't know if anyone has seen Alan Savory's TED talk. I mean, it is very, uh, it's sort of wow stuff. Uh, but, but is there any substance? I mean, is there any research that, that, that is behind anything that he said? <laughs> well, I haven't been asked to swear any oaths yet, so I don't know <laughs> if it's a cult. But, um, this, yeah, um, he's been basically developing this over the last 40, 50 years and has worked with quite a number of researchers uh, at different times. So I was talking to one gentleman earlier and he'd actually done a proof of concept at one point. Um, a proof of concept? Oh, that's yes. good news. At least you've got but, so <laughs> there is some research out there, but a lot more is needed. So it's only in the last few years uh, that there's really been a big push to get visibility and really increase the usage of the methods. So a lot more research is needed, both for further refining the method and also building confidence behind it. So yeah, if anyone's interested, <laughs> because it's kind of a chicken and an egg problem as well. You have lots of researchers who are saying, oh, there's no research base behind it, so we don't believe in it, but they're the people who we need to do the research. So if everybody's criticizing it and not looking into it because there's a lack of research, it's never going to happen. So you've got your open minded to, to that in terms of needing to bring research uh, people. Do you talk to anyone here? There are several fodder people. In, uh... Oh, good. Oh, Polly, yeah. that is good news. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And I've talked to quite a few people, but any introductions would be greatly appreciated. Okay. Um, uh, Asagi, is there any research, but now you, you've had a previous research program, but is there still currently research going on? Are you, uh, are you counting the number of people that do this, that, and the other, or is there, what, what, what is the research base to what you're, you're doing? No, Brian, there's quite a lot of research in, uh, in the LIFES project as well, but a different type of research in terms of uh, the issues that we raised in, in the group discussions. Uh, how do you deliver technologies? 
how do you set up an effective uh, uh, knowledge sharing, knowledge management systems? How do you do capacity development? I think Diana talks about a lot on capacity development. How, do, how best can you do that? You can do experimentation on this. Uh, we have so you're looking, you're trying to find out who are the people that you need to be uh, working with in terms of training and training trainers, I e see. Exactly. There is quite a lot of TOT, TOT in terms of capacity development of our partners, whom we think are implementers of whatever technologies we have, but we walk the talk with them. And how, then do you get, how do you get, because many people, uh, in, I would imagine, in these smallholder farms, um, they're not remotely interested in research, and they've seen you popping in and out over the years, and they think, oh, no, here comes Octavia again. Yeah. I mean, but, but how do you keep the momentum going with the, with, with the research and in that development project? Well, I think the beauty of having uh, such type of project is uh, the, the involvement of action research. Okay. You know, we, we uh, you okay? I'm fine. <laughs> Don't forget our promise at the Vivo <laughs> Club, yeah? <laughs> Uh, uh, is an opportunity for us to intervene with whatever technologies that are available from IRI, from the national system, from the international knowledge banks. Intervention is very important for us, and based on the inter intervention, we do collect data, we come up with the evidence, and we pass it on to the extension system. Okay. Let me, is, uh, now, have you heard of this uh, initiative in the AFA region? She is a good friend of mine. She has been talking to me about oh. uh, what we can do in AFA as now, IRI, not as LIVES project, because okay. LIVES is in the four highland regions yes, in I the crop realize. livestock system. But there are spin-offs from, from these systems that can really So you're work about in to uh, uh, go hop off down to, to the Danakil, are you? Not really. I work for IRI. Well, if I remember, if I, I think you're you'd be very wise, because I think it was a bit, there were a few hazards for people going down to the Danica, for men anyway. Well, exactly <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> if, if you end up to be the wrong <laughs> person down there, then you'll definitely be in trouble. I've but, been down but, there. But I've been yeah. down there. For us, I, mean, uh, and I, I came away uh, without being castrated. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I can still see the testosterone. <laughs> It's manifested through the testosterone anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the issue is, I think there are some commonalities that we can share with, the, uh, with Sarah's project. Okay. And, and I am an individual. I work for IRI, for your information. And we have got this organization here that can provide support. We're putting a lot of influence to, to come up with you know, programs in the pastoral areas. Um, Peter, one of the, the major problem that animal health technologies uh, for things like East Coast fever and uh, African swine fever, and not so much necessarily African swine fever, but those endemic parasitic diseases that occur in Africa and Asia, there is no market for the products. There is no uh, substantial market. And the pharmaceutical industry would much rather develop uh, products for dogs and cats for, uh, uh, for the people in the worried well uh, than they would looking at your things. How do you cope with that? Well, I, I think things are changing rather rapidly. And I would say even in the eight years that galvmed has been in existence, when, when we started, really, there was no private sector interest in the segment that we're seeking to serve, seeking to operate in. Uh, and that's definitely changed now. And it's largely due to the change in policy of the funders, if we're honest. Um, you know, but, the, but now four of the five top five uh, animal health companies have got clear Africa strategies. They're interested in moving into... You know, the areas that we that we work in, um, they they they've made commitments and uh, and and I don't think it's true to say there's no market. For just to give you one example, we've recently signed up um, with a an Indian uh, uh, company producing Newcastle disease vaccine, and they've made a commitment of their own money, admittedly with some of our money, uh, to put in place a distribution scheme which will employ roughly 80 uh, sales reps operating into the very regions with a primary focus on going to uh, smallholder uh, uh, producers. But ultimately you rely on, you have a large Great Gates Foundation uh, grant you and GIFID I think still supports you, so you very much rely, your existence relies on uh, public sector money or donor money uh, to provide the interface. That you Absolutely, we, I mean we facilitate, we de-risk, as soon as the private sector is picking up and going in themselves and we don't need you to be there. You de-risk? Uh, what, tell me about de-risking. De -risking. You want to know about de-risking? <laughs> well, I mean, basically, any intervention that we do which allow, makes it easier for a private sector company or, or I mean, when I say private sector, I mean anyone from a, a vaccinator at village level who's making an income from 
giving vaccines to, to chickens or, or to sheep or goats, all the way up to a multinational company, anything that's making it more likely that they're going to participate in the sector, which, which of course, we look at from the smallholder producer point of view, but they look at in the holistic view of, um, you know, can they serve the commercial sector as well as the smallholder sector, which is fine from our point of view, uh, because they're there for profits, and that's the only way sustainability will occur if there's profits shared along the value chain. Uh, and uh, which you know, which is meeting everybody's needs. So what we're looking to do is to take out, you know, to if we can provide a vaccine which nobody would have developed before because it wasn't commercially viable, and somebody takes it up and makes a product of it, that's great. If we can stimulate private sector veterinarians to move out from government into their own businesses, that's great. If we can put a village a lady in a village who's responsible for vaccinating all the chickens in that village and she makes a cent a dose every time she gives a dose, that's great. Okay. That's the sort of level. Okay. I'm Thank about. you. Um, Sarah, you, you, um, I saw that one of the, the, the objectives is to, uh, is to increase the number of cattle in the AFA. Um, is that, I thought that in areas of land like that, one was trying to get a sort of a more manageable uh, number of cattle, but not increase. I mean, I think that you're, what do, what do people think about that? Depends who you talk to, I guess. Okay, well, give me as an example of two different people. What does the government think about this example? Well, I think the government's quite interested in the opportunity that intensification sustainably in this kind of area provides. Livestock exports are a very important contributor to foreign exchange earnings. What will Henning Steinfeld think about this? You think that here you are, you're going to put more greenhouse gases, uh, you, you know, the, 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 that map with all the dark colours coming out of, uh, out of Africa and you're going to add to that. You, does that worry you at all? Not Should really. No. I don't think so because if we can also promote carbon sequestration in the soil and significantly improve the quality of the soil and the organic carbon content it should probably negate the... And, and you've got plans to do that? Well that's the goal, improving the soil through grazing management, increasing the amount of litter left on the soil not grazing down to bare ground. How do you get, uh, you just breeze in and you get people to, to say, oh, what a good idea. I mean, how the adoption of this, uh, of this idea, it must be incredibly difficult. Um, talking to some of the uh, top guys in Kenya uh, last week, it was quite interesting. One of them said, well, pastoralists get the idea in about two seconds. Ranchers, it maybe takes five minutes. Government people, maybe five years. Scientists, 15 years. <laughs> so, okay, that's, the, a, that's a very interesting perspective. So, you, yeah. because the, the buy in is that the pastoralist communities are, are, are desperate, if you like. Or, or to an extent, yeah. So, he was also talking about different types of communities that he's worked in. Our experience in AFA was that on our first conversation, when we were talking about some different insights that are included in the model, they were very keen to get started straight away. So, you went in straight away with the community engagement rather than with, uh, with a business plan and, and, and with you as, as the director or directoress? Or well, we had a business plan, an idea, okay. and then we went to talk to the communities to see if they would be interested in the idea. Because if the communities aren't interested, it's a non-starter. Uh, how do you get on with the... You, you speak, your husband is Ethiopian, I understand. Yeah. Uh, you speak... Uh, presumably fluent Amharic uh, now. Uh, My spoken Amharic is pretty terrible, but I can read quite well. Oh, really? <laughs> I remember when I lived here, I could, I could speak it moderately, but I could never think of reading or writing it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Asagi, um, you also have experience of, of, of animal health technologies. Are there animal health technologies going into your, uh, this area in, in terms of the lives program? Yes. Yes, we do have a, a livestock component because we uh, animal health component because we work on value chain for these five livestock commodities, and uh, we we deal with production interventions, we deal with the input supply services, processing and marketing for each commodity. So, in the production technologies, we have got animal health component, and it also comes back in the input supply services component. How do you uh, who? The, the, the major problem has been these input services in many of how do you get sustainable input services for health 
for feed and this sort of thing. How, what happens in, in your project areas? Coming uh, from a uh, uh, livestock production oriented uh, scientist, uh, we found it uh, very difficult to deal with the uh, public and private services. Because he, in he's in going to come up with a vaccine, but exactly. who's going to deliver the that's, vaccine? That's basically the question. I mean, our focus, particularly uh, in promoting this uh, value chain of these commodities, is how do we really reconfigure the input supply services component of that, and how do we link small farmers with markets and processes? So it's, it's a challenging one. Uh, predominantly in the highlands, we have got the public sector, you know, playing a significant role in input supply services, but things seem to be changing uh, uh, slightly. Whose responsibility is it? We, we, the, we had a little conversation, Peter, you and I, about, about public and private uh, goods, if you like, uh, and the, I, I remember I did something for your organization a few years ago, uh, looking at uh, the markets for livestock vaccines, particularly CBPP, uh, PPR, and, and other ones. Um, and most of the vaccine-producing companies I in Africa uh, don't have a market specialist, or they've got a market specialist. And the market doesn't depend on how many people out there want the vaccines. It depends on what donor is going to pay this year or next year, or what uh, government is going to pay. And so it's, these aren't really, um, to have these as, uh, as public responsibility is absolutely bizarre. Isn't it? So, in the end, animal health inputs will only work within a private sector setting, with with certain obvious exceptions, I believe. And I you're right. I wonder if Walter Masiga is, is here. I mean, he is. I can see him. What would Walter say that you? Because I mean, I I w am, am a believer that foot and mouth disease vaccine in Kenya, for example, is a private good at the moment, with the exception of a few uh, areas in which you've got. Uh, livelihood severely affected possibly. What is your view? So my view is there isn't an animal health, there isn't a, a veterinary service in the world that I'm aware of where it effectively works within the public sector. Obviously there's a proper role for the public sector but the private sector as it t in terms of animal health inputs should be driving it in most cases. Now there are, and it, and it will vary by country or by region, but you know, there will be certain diseases which will always remain a public good and should always remain a public good. But by and large, we should be looking to put things into the private sector where possible. Okay. To give you, if I, just if I can give you one example, Rift Valley fever, I don't think will ever be, you know, we know that it comes in cycles. It's unlikely that it's ever going to properly be a private good. But if you could put that into a combination vaccine with, you know, other va antigens, CCPP, uh, PPR, uh, uh, sheep and goat pox, for example, and get a combination vaccine, that would be in immensely attractive. And it wouldn't, you know, it, it doesn't, the cost doesn't go up with each antigen. It's, um, Have so you thought of, uh, Sarah, of, of animal health I inputs into, into the AFAR system? I think they'll be very, very important in the long term. That's not an area that I know much about, so I would be relying on experts like yourselves to... Um, bring in that knowledge. So yeah, we'll be leveraging the knowledge of a lot of organizations to support the communities to bring in the resources that they want. Um, yes, and the difficulties of getting those services provided in that particular region, I think, would be greater, uh, would be greater, than, uh, greater than most. Um, yes, Cook, you were going to say? Fortunately, Azag is an expert. He's an expert in, 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 in uh, in everything. The other thing that I that uh, <laughs> I I call him Fituari, uh, which is um, which is from the old uh, Ethiopian imperial system of a of, of someone who is very um, very high up in the, in the system. Part of your part of your uh, goal is also looking at uh, community intercommunity conflict. Is that correct? Well, you've got a lot of conflict coming up between communities when the land is degrading more and more and they have to go further to collect grasses. So, for example, when we were visiting one community earlier this year during the drought period in Zavon Afar, they, the previous day, they'd actually had a live fire conflict with the neighbouring community. Now, if we can improve the grasslands, they don't need to go into the buffer zones between the communities. It will decrease the likelihood of conflict and hopefully 
move towards the potential for improved relationships between communities. And also using the holistic management methods, looking at the holistic context and bringing these communities together so that they can see that they have common interests and common goals. They can see that they do share a lot of things as opposed to just fighting over grass. As a, we, 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 have to, we have to end here. I, I like to think that, uh, that learning uh, is a lifelong exercise uh, and, and research is such a crucial part of, uh, of development programs. Uh, is that, do you share that idea, all, uh, uh, all of you, or uh, could you, would you comment on that as a last, uh, uh, as a last um, statement? Well, this is proving to be an amazing learning curve, and I'm loving it, so definitely. You've learned from uh, all these experts here. Everyone around me at the moment, it's fantastic. Peter, where, uh, what, the value of research to, what you, you, to all, your, all your directors in, in your, all these countries? No, I mean, we, we need a vibrant research community to feed in you know, to the development of products. Novel trypanocytes is another area we're working on. Um, you know, there's a there's a whole bunch of areas where there's great work going on. It just needs to be taken all the way through the development, the product development cycle, uh, to deliver products at the end. And it's clearly the challenges are immense, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be taking our stepwise approach to to putting it into place. Fitawari, thank you as much. <laughs> uh, Brian, you you probably know uh, my my thinking in terms of IRI, in terms of development, so on and so forth. I am a great believer in knowledge and capacity development, knowledge regeneration through research and all this. You can take a country, you can take a community, you can take the continent. If you don't have knowledge, you don't have capacity, forget about it. It's not going to happen. So research, very vital, very important component of our, our, our life. But I would like to see more linkage between research, research outputs and community development. Thank you all very much, and thank you very much for bringing a different perspective to this research development interface. Thank you.